so relevant. But. Yeah, so as Phil said, uh, so my connection is a, a little bit indirect, so I have a very simple message. Um, if you're going to make a cryogenic computer, quantum computer, such as one based on Joseph's injunctions, like what, what Mark mentioned Google is doing, you're going to need to control it. If you're going to have a thousand qubits, I don't think you're going to have a thousand coaxial cables going into the cryostat so that you're controlling each qubit from a thousand uh, you know, pulse generators up in the room. You're going to need something in the cryostat that does that control. And one way to do that would be to have actually a superconducting classical computer down there next to your quantum computer. So that may sound far-fetched to you, but actually that technology exists. There's something called uh, single flux quantum logic. It was invented at MSU, Moscow State University, <laughs> in the late 80s and early 90s by Konstantin Likarev and his collaborators. But most of that group moved to SUNY Stony Brook, and then it spread out a little bit around the country. It's now mostly confined to a few big companies, such as Northrop Grumman, IBM, and a few other places. But um, anyway, that logic exists. And it turns out there are people, even aside from quantum computing, who want to try to develop energy efficient computing. And so there's this IARPA program, it's called C3 for cryogenic computing complexity. It's basically a program to build a superconducting classical computer mm -hmm. that operates at you know, four degrees Kelvin, mm -hmm. liquid helium. Um, and that needs, of course, logic and memory. The logic, as I say, has been pretty well developed, although there's still a lot to be done. But the memory, it turns out, was a big, uh, a big bottleneck, and that's where I come in because, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on superconductor ferromagnetic devices, and it turns out you can take a Joseph's injunction, put some ferromagnets in it, and it becomes a memory device. This is actually a picture of the Northrop Grumman memory cell, and that little guy there is the active element, and that's what I work on. So I have this tight connection with Northrop Grumman to develop memory for the system, and that's that's my connection. And so you know we've written papers on how that things work, and then they've written a paper showing how how it all works together. Um, and then um, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that there are clearly people looking into using this type of system to control qubits. I just picked a paper. These are some people that we happen to know. Uh, McDermott is at Wisconsin, um, Fleurd is at Syracuse, and uh, Buchanoff is at Hypers, a company that actually does uh, this, this SFQ sort of stuff. So, and I'm sure people like Google and Microsoft and IBM and people like that are, are certainly looking into this. Uh, and then I'd see there are two things I wanted to mention that aren't on this slide. But yeah, my latest three graduate students, one is just went, was about to go to IBM to work in quantum computing. One uh, went to MIT Lincoln Labs to work in quantum computing. And the third went to Northrop Grumman. He's actually not doing quantum computing. He's working on this project. Uh, but who knows what he'll be doing in the near future. Uh, and then the other thing is I have to go teach at 4 o'clock. So I'm not <laughs> going to be able to drink and enjoy meeting you. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Norman. The class will be more exciting.